let's get going. Would you? Does that sound good for you, Connie Marie? That sounds good. Okay. Okay. My name's Alan Friesen. This show is called The 1,000 Ways. It is called after the quote from Rumi that there are 1,000 ways to kiss the earth. So through this show, we are going to discover one of those 1,000 ways to kiss the earth. I have a guest with me. I actually have a live, a live audience. My wife is right here. She's the live audience. <laughs> Somehow I screwed up the technology, and she couldn't watch it from my phone. I don't know how I did that. But anyways, and my guest, virtually guest, is Connie Marie. Connie Marie, I've known you for a long time. You're a wonderful person, a very much a do-gooder, somebody who wants to improve people's lives, especially women. You have a... A, a very strong interest in helping women, right? So yes. tell us about, I've no, known you in many different roles, but tell us about what your passion is, what it is that you would, if you could wave your magic wand, what difference would you make in the world? Uh, I think you kind of hit the nail on the head when you said it's working with women. Um, I work a lot with working moms and that's been my passion for 25 years. My youngest son, just turned 25 and I started uh, doing life coaching, I guess is kind of what, what we called it at the time, but life coaching. And the reason I did that was because I wanted to be at home more with my kids. And so I started to do that. I had had a background in career development um, and a lot of crisis intervention. So I decided to go ahead and, and give that a shot. And I just stuck with it. It's been, so I've been, you know, working uh, with clients one on one at home for 25 years. Wow, wow! And I know that you—it's a—it's not your scope of how you help them is quite broad. The last Facebook post you had was about financial aspects, right? Yeah. Financial planning and kind of sorting out your new reality and maybe making a plan for what things you can trim back and those kind of things, right? If I recall correctly. Yeah, because life coaching is so, it doesn't really mean anything. It kind of became a trend term that people started to use. But what you have to look at is any particular coach that you work with, life coach, uh, what they're trained in. So I'm, my main three major areas that I'm certified and trained in would be as a career development professional. The other is a, a Canadian uh, personal financial coach and as well an insolvency counselor. So I did work for a bankruptcy trustee for a couple of years doing insolvency counseling. Um, and then the third would be uh, spiritual. I trained with a sacred psychologist for about 15 years out of San Diego um, on a, you know, very, just having so many training sessions a year. So it's kind of, those are my, my three areas. But when you look at a woman or a mother and her life, um, those are really, I think, three paramount areas looking at, uh, you know, looking at how she cares for her family and, and financially what she does for a career, what she does, and then uh, the faith that she carries with her. Right. So tell me more. I didn't. Th I don't think I know much about this spiritual psychologist um, training or coaching or program that you've been through. So tell me more about that. I I trained with the spiritual psychologist, and it was uh, very non-denominational. So it is not in any way uh, based on any religion. Um, so women from all faith. We used to come together so many times a year, and. Um, I, I guess primarily what I do now has a lot to do with why she worked with us. What she helped us to work through with individuals was to deal with the unexpected. And uh, so certainly in, in this time, I mean, we're probably, Alan, like you and I, uh, we're in a time that we will look back as dealing with the most unexpected in our lifetime. So what she helped us to do was to learn sometimes how to support when you can do nothing right uh, okay yeah and and that's really you know when they're for um that i guess is more obvious uh around death around you know serious illness and things like that but um it, it also in this time we are certainly in a place where we're dealing with the unexpected and there's a lot of things especially with the quarantine for example, where we're very restricted in what we can do. We have lost our ability to maybe do things the way we've always done them. Yeah, yeah, no, very true, very true. And when you're saying about doing something for them when there's really nothing you can do for them, it's really just kind of like being there sort of a thing, right? Is that correct? Is that what you're saying? 
yes, it's very, being very, very supportive, um, very compassionate toward them. And um, often there are a different approaches, practical approaches, and I guess that's how uh, you look at what, you know, the, the field of, that particular field of sacred psychology. It's more about giving someone, for example, a practical approach rather than a therapy, whereas um, a psychologist, for example, would work with psychotherapy, um, whereas um, the sacred psychology we learned was more about practical approaches. What little changes can you make? What big changes can you make? Um, how do you day to day? Okay. You know, what do you do a lot of it is lifestyle changes. You know how you can adjust your lifestyle to move through whatever it is you're moving through. Because often you're supporting. When I work with a client, they're supporting a family member, for example, who's not well or who's in crisis. Or so I often support those who are supporting others. And I liked your term the other day. You know, you said, uh, you know, who do you serve? Uh, and I think that's very important right now because I believe there's always a place that any of us can serve at this point, even with the, the quarantine or the isolation, is, is it, there could be one person, you sure. know, one person that you could call every day or, um, you know, one person that you could drop meals off to on their doorstep or could be just one person, but if we all, just supported one person that would make a huge difference in the world very much so there's this oh by the way i got to tell you one thing too it is totally okay to sing a response if you want use a little bit of song lyrics that's totally fine on this show Connie Marie, just so you know so feel comfortable if you want because when you're talking about how you care for somebody when there's really nothing you can do i think paul mm -hmm. thorne's words are really appropriate it's that oh. show them that you love them by really being there something like that I'd have to sing the whole song to get it right, but it's something like that, okay? So you go ahead yeah. and sing any part that you want to sing, okay? I will do that. All right, thing. good, okay. Yeah. But the other thing I was gonna say was, um, so it sounds like, one, where you're talking about, you know, do maybe you can help one person, so why wouldn't you help the one person, right? I think it was Andy Stanley, I heard this quote recently, and if I recall it correctly, it is, do for one what you wish you could do for all. And that's okay. sweet, right? If you know, if I can do this, or I can help two people, or whatever the number is, I can help. That I'd want everybody to have that advantage, or or have that benefit, kind of a thing. It's a very sweet quote. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then the second thing is. Yeah, and I also. Go ahead. I also do some work with seniors, so. With seniors. Um, and their, with seniors and their families, so families that are dealing with seniors and trying to work with transitions and through transitions and things like that which is you know again right now that is definitely the highest risk population again yeah because they're very isolated and 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 a lot of times it's just like a phone call right just like touch and base and and it doesn't have to be skype or zoom or google duo or any of those kind of things it could be just a phone call just hey thinking of you how you doing right that kind of thing yeah. i watched uh, just watched a short tv blurb the other day and it was interesting because uh, there was a gentleman and he said something that i'd never ever thought about that made so much sense was you know what we're feeling now in I, this isolation that's new for us many seniors feel all the time who are uh, family doesn't live near them or um, they are in a seniors care home and again family isn't isn't close by and I, I never thought about that but yeah it's very that very makes sense, right yeah hmm. and then also your your um spiritual psychologist training it sounds it has very little to do with what happens after you die it's more about choices you make today to have a better tomorrow kind of a thing is that am i following you correctly yes, yes absolutely yeah okay. yeah okay. sacred psychology is not necessarily about death it's more about um, what's happening um, as you're living your lifestyle and right right yeah so and you um and do you have a theory you want to share about what happens after you die do i have a theory well i guess like maybe I, i'm just hoping we go to heaven I, I, don't, I guess that's yeah i guess my belief is i hope that there is somewhere we we end up that's that's easier yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's a nicer, more enjoyable type place, right? Yes. Okay. Yeah. 
Um, <clears throat> okay, so what I wanted to, go ahead. I, wanted to, uh, I think that um, one of the, the areas that I'd like to refer to um, as we continue the conversation is what I call family solidarity. Let's talk about so, it now. Yeah, when we're talking about new approaches to this, this time, uh, because it's difficult not to talk about this time, um, but I've been writing um, about, on, on my blog, I've been writing about family solidarity. And what that means to me is it is um, a little, I guess, a different approach than how most families are living today, um, in that we start to take more responsibility together for what's going on at home, uh, what's happening financially, what's so, uh, even, you know, if you have younger children, it's maybe a little more difficult, but those who have teens or have young adults in the home, a lot of people today have young adults. I have my youngest son and his girlfriend here now um, that came, they came back to stay for this uh, isolation period. So family solidarity to me is looking at, um, you know, our life a little bit differently as a family and how we can work together and how we can, you know, make things easier because we're all participating, not only what's happening at home, but we're all participating to make the changes that need to be made. And Alan, this is your world because, you know, you have spent your life uh, working on the benefits side, protecting families. And I watched you do that for years, you know, protecting families through disabilities and through, illnesses and through, um, you know, when they end up in another country and something goes wrong or they need a special surgery or, so really what you and I are in the same world because at the end of the day, to me, it's about family protection, but we have to get better at knowing how to protect our own families. Yeah, um, makes sense, Connie Murray. I'm with you hundred percent, yeah. <laughs> and like a, a part of that too is kind of, it's maybe a little bit of a redistribution of duties within the family dynamics as well, right? You oh, know, absolutely. many times, like it's in a normal, busy work life kind of a thing, women are doing the majority of the load. That's the reality of it, right? They've got jobs outside the home and they're doing everything to keep the household running generally, right? And so I think that's a, uh, I, I see this as a little bit of a kind of a, a reset in terms of, how your the dynamics work in your house, right? That kind of a thing. Like I've been, huge, I've been. It's go a ahead. Huge, huge paradigm shift. Just having the time. Right. So when you and I, so about three years ago, you and I were doing the same business expansion training, a, a government program that we took. And at the time, I looked at doing that because my business had been dropping, and I not understanding why. And what we discovered were there were two reasons. The reason that working moms were accessing me less was number one was time because they were absolutely overwhelmed, and cost not that the cost because I, you know, the costs my costs are reasonable actually. It was more about. There's so many things, activities and things going on in the household with children that they just don't have, take the, I guess they don't spend that money um, on looking at other things or, or support for themselves. Mothers have a tendency to support their children's activities rather than support themselves. So what was, was interesting about that was time was the number one issue. And now we have all this time um, that we have available to do things in our family we haven't done for a long time. And I, and I think the freedom in that um, is, bring, is going to bring some joy to families. You know, if they can get over some of the hurdles, especially if you have the, like to me, the financial reality and the loss that people could incur, that is, is very, very difficult. Like absolutely um, the biggest red flag and the most difficult. But if people can get some kind of plan in place where they feel they can at least sustain where they are, um, then it, there's a tremendous opportunity here to have some freedom that we haven't had for a long time and to do some of the things that, that we haven't been able to do, to take that time with our kids and especially working moms to actually take the time with their children and, and yeah. do it, it could be in 10 years or 15 years from now, you know, kids look back on this as being the best time they ever had in their whole life when they had the 
the total attention of their mom and dad and they were hanging out with them every day and, you know, reading or singing or whatever they were doing. Right. It could very well be that way. Right. So. Yeah. And a good friend of yours the other day, um, Mandy, she put up an interesting quote that she had gotten from someone that said, it'll be interesting when this is all over what we don't want to go back to. Yeah, I, I agree. Yeah. yeah. I think it's a world changing type of a thing. And the other, you know, the other thing that I, I'm pretty sure is going to like, my lovely bride just walked back in here we've been spending a whole bunch more time together we've been talking a bunch more we've been it's been good we've been cooking meals together well most of her cooking and me doing dishes but but it's been enjoyable right and so this is you know once you're once you kind of had this change in your life for a bit you might say hmm i kind of like these aspects like i can see a big flurry of work from home that just now this kind of resets it and where there was i forget i don't know what the number was 12 percent of people would work from home in the past all of a sudden it's going to be 90 percent, right that's mm -hmm. what i think is going to happen because if you can manage your life better your product productivity stays the same for your employer your life is better why wouldn't it happen right so so there's is some opportunity which you know in something that's so hard um it's very hard to think about it that way but i think for families um, there is some opportunity to just be together and you know the family is the foundation um, you know when you say your thousand ways um, you know the family is still the foundation of our culture of our country um, and if there's some like you said reset that needs to go on um, there's been a lot of overwhelm uh, and family breakdown is the highest it's ever been in history so uh, hopefully this reset will help some of the underground issues that we're you know that we don't um, that we see more on the social services side right yeah exactly cool so family uh, solidarity is that like your term or is that for me that's my that's my term I'm, is it oh good I'm not nice. the first one to talk about it but i'll give you uh go through some of the key points that i see you know kind of part of the movement of family solidarity what it'll look like if we could call it a movement uh one is uh, just a new level of compassion for each other and I, I in simple terms I I've I believe that you know when we're all stuck together that we almost have to um, adopt a model of kindness like many workplaces have done recently you know it's been a trend there's been a lot of movement towards kindness but I believe that's part of how we uh, have to treat each other because everyone is in a difficult place and some are managing better than others um, emotionally some are not managing so I think the just a, a model of compassion and kindness uh, will be helpful and and just stopping I you know once in a while something will irritate me and I just stop and step back and say okay in the, in the big picture this is just is just a little thing but it's not easy to live together again especially when you've had you know your kids come back home that have been away it's it's not easy to do that and it's not easy to have younger children all day in sure. the house trying to work so oh trying to work and all of a sudden they're the teacher too right so you know oh, that, that's a whole more to do right even that's where we have to do the shared responsibility so that's probably the most important piece is to look at how responsibilities can be shared even amongst you know just husband and wife like you said like who's doing more cooking or who's helping out with the housework um, one of the things that we do is we have a weekly meeting too because this isn't going to just happen no. you know family you you have a role as and in the family as a husband as a wife as a teenager those roles have been established and they're ingrained so uh, changes are not going to happen unless you actually sit down and talk about them much like organizations really you know it's no different than an organization where you have to make a major shift you need to get everybody together and talk about it and i think families need to do that too so we've been moving back to a you know a weekly meeting where sunday mornings we sit and have coffee and we say okay what's what's working what's not working you know what can we change here we do that on the financial side too because you know that takes constant monitoring right now for us it like everyone else it takes some monitoring of where we're at and uh, the longer this goes on what is that going to look like so figuring all that out the family financial adjustment too is important especially if you've got young adults at home because you, you they possibly need to contribute so i might have like in our family unit my husband's working and my son is working and i'm 
seeing some clients, but I had a contract that I was doing that I've lost. So it, it, whoever is working might need to contribute more than the, the one that's not working. And that might not be the way it's always been. Nope. You know, if you have two parents that are not working and you have, you know, a, a, an adult child in the house, they might have to contribute quite a bit for yeah. you to get through this time. So yeah. that's really important um, just to, again, every anything goes on the table, but it has to come to the table. You know, in our house, we always had a rule that everything comes to the table. It has to come to the table because we don't talk about it and open that door, then it's, it's not going to happen. And it's going to be tough to change. Um, but it, I, I think it's, not as hard to change when something has to change, when you can see the result on the other side of it. But we don't want to come out of this with, um, you know, some family members put in a bankruptcy situation or uh, no. when it could have been avoided because everybody kind of worked together. So that's more of an extreme case, but we, we have to be conscious of it. But, you know, <clears throat> I agree entirely. And there's lots, you know, you and I are probably in a more favored position, if you will, right? You know, we, we live in a nice warm house, our utilities are paid, we got enough groceries, we're, you know, we have enough cash flow that, yes, this is going to be an inconvenience, but we're going to be able to get by with that and, and that kind of thing. And there's other people have a lot less resources, right? That's a fact. And so they're in a, in a tougher go. <clears throat> but I think in one respect, this has really kind of been where it's sort of an equalizer beyond the family unit. I think it's an equalizer in terms of everybody, really, in the whole, whole world. This is affecting everywhere. Everybody in the whole world really has a common, hey, this is something that could impact me as well, right? We share in protecting ourselves and protecting each other to minimize the effects of COVID, right? That's kind of really how it works, right? And not just COVID. It might be COVID-19 this year and in seven years it's whatever something different right so in terms of i think it's going to change our whole <clears throat> our new reality is going to look quite different than our old reality mm -hmm. i think how we shop for groceries is going to change somewhat i think mm -hmm. how we interact with people i think like fundraising and events how, how are those going to change if you look at like even musical performers like now a lot of them are just going on and and doing concerts on facebook or whatever and and for the ones that are a touring band, that that's their revenue, well, they're asking their, their fans to kick in some money, right? So, and right. you can understand because that's, their revenue is gone, right? So, yeah. yeah. So that's such a good point. Things could look um, a lot different, right? It could look yeah, more. it could be quite different in terms of how the new normal after this could be quite different than the normal was before. And mm -hmm. the other thing, although economic concerns, I think they're uh, like, they're real and they're a problem and people would lose jobs and lose money and go bankrupt. I agree. But your health is still more important than your wealth, than your financial wealth, right? If you have health, you can serve somebody and you can create an income again, right? If you don't have health, you're out of luck, right? You can't do that. So all of the other things are going to sort themselves out, but keeping yourself healthy is pretty much the most important thing that you can do. Would yeah, and even, even for a family, the emotional and physical health of each family member right now um, is really important because, you know, even a young child, um, the big changes might have impacted them. Uh, we have many young disabled children, for example, that are not in school in their routine uh, with support and with the systems that they had. And so there, there just could be, there's just so many different things to consider. Um, I think we all, you know, that everyone has certain many, you know, professionals have profound knowledge levels, but many individuals, just anyone that has had an experience in life might be able to help someone else, Expect, especially an experience around loss. When you've had significant experiences around loss, it might be a time that you can help those uh, that have not had those experiences. It's, it's about helping. It's, it's not about, um, you know, marketing to them or trying to sell them something. Right now, uh, we had that discussion in our, our business club conversation. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's about how can we help people get through? How can we help each other to get, get through this? Um, it's just uh, some points that, that I, I think that have come up in a, a number of ways, but part of the family solidarity, solidarity concept as well is 
we do need, most families need some kind of routine. So freedom is new for us and being at home is new. And, um, but establishing some kind of daily routine, especially for kids, you know, we all know kids sleep better, they do better, they need some kind of routine. So you're gonna have to set up a new routine. And again, try and write it down or put it on a calendar or put it in a day timer and think, well, I you know, don't have to use a day timer. I think it's helpful because it, it, for me, it helps to even have this, like having this on the calendar today, I had something to look forward to. So sometimes uh, having a new routine and documenting the documentation gives us things to look forward to. The and other thing to pay attention to- You might find about adjusting it a little bit to your routine, say, hey, you know what? I think I'm gonna change this up a little bit, right? Sorry to yeah, interrupt you. No, you can, but I think you have to start somewhere and especially when you have kids to have some kind of routine. The other is your own body rhythm. So everybody's going to have a different body rhythm. And I don't know if you've experienced this, but there's some days, like my dad used to say, you're, my get up and go got up and went. Like I've got things to do and I want to do things and I am just exhausted. Mm -hmm. And so pay real close attention to your own body rhythm and to the body rhythm of, the, of your family members as well because everybody's is different. And there's going to be days that you're going to need to rest and there's going to be days that you want to take action you want to do something so for me i've started the, the spring cleaning um you know one day a week anyway because i i can't do all this sitting so we work out every day we we have videos to help us do some exercise every day for at least a half an hour and then we walk when it's nice or nice out when we get outside and walk but we we just find it's it's really really helpful too to not be too hard on yourself that uh, this is this is too much change for <laughs> for us humans. It's a lot of change at once, and there's going to be time for yourself, right? Enjoy each day as much as you can. In yes. the walk doesn't have to be long, right? It just it, a little bit of a walk helps a lot, right? So yeah, and how different people are because for some people it's movement, and for some people it's meditation. We're all everybody is different, so it, it's really interesting how well we're gonna get to know ourselves during yes. this time. You know, we're gonna to get to know ourselves and our family members again at a deeper level. Yes. Um, when we look at things like our emotional responses and our body rhythms and what works for us as far as, you know, movement or rest, or we're gonna to get to know ourselves better. And that's a positive thing again that we can carry forward. I agree entirely. And it's a great opportunity to experiment a little bit, right? Try some different things and see how it works, right? Uh, the last little bit, I've been doing these body scans in the morning, right? And it's just just kind of starting from my feet and working all the way up. And then just like check kind of the, the status, if you will. How does that joint function? And how does that feel? And there's no pain in there. moves easy. Yeehaw. You know, if you go all the way up and your whole body's working well and the joints are moving like they're supposed to, that's like, that's a pretty good thing right there. That's, uh, that's very encouraging. And yeah, something and you can really appreciate, right? So. Remember, too, that some people emotionally, this is going to be too difficult and they need to see a mental health professional. Definitely. Mental, mental health issues around this could be significant for a lot of people, um, especially people who do already uh, suffer some, with some form of depression or anxiety or so. Connie Marie, Corolla just, Corolla just spoke to herself care. when you're talking about that. She's very much concerned. I'm, I'm less so, but she, anxiety. not anxiety. Yeah. She's very concerned, yeah. like, you know, that, that she could get sick and then she couldn't take her horse, care of her horses and took, take care of herself and help take care of me and, and, uh, and maybe die. Right. Like those kind of things. But she's a healthy, strong woman who's taken all the precautions. I'm taking all the precautions because she tells me to. So we're going to be yeah. just fine. So anyways, sorry to interrupt there. I thought I'd interject that. And anybody oh, who has access to an employee family assistance plan, use it. And that's there the only one. there's a bunch of them, right, Connie Marie? Yeah. Yeah. So if you're predisposed to anxiety or depression, then you, you need to, like you say, you find out what's available through the benefit plan. So I guess that would be a question I would have for you that I think is important for families to know too. When a, uh, an, a parent is in a layoff situation, do they still are they still able to access benefits or does that depend on the company? Almost all employers I know have really just taken, they've called me and said, 
I want to extend coverage. Can I extend coverage for my people? I have to lay them off, but I want to extend coverage, almost all of them. And uh, oh. so, yeah, they'll, they'll still have that coverage in force. Now, they might not be able to see a counselor face-to-face, -face, but there's still telephonic and, and video-based type supports that are out there. So oh, even if yes. you can't see yeah. a counselor, you can still get some help, right? So. Yeah, and then there's also local um, psychologists available too that right. you can see too, or a medical medical doctors. I know not all medical doctors are doing that, but there but some are. So there are some doctors that you can get a hold of and do an appointment by or do something by phone if it's serious, right? Right. You can't. Yeah. 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 So you know, one thing when you're asked, when you're talking about your, you know, what what difference you can make that's going to make a better tomorrow, that kind of a thing. Yes. Since I've been home, I doubled up my training regimen. Oh. Yeah. I used to train an hour a day and two hours a day on Saturday and Sunday. Now I'm two hours every day and four hours on Saturday and Sunday. That's well, you'd be a role model because that's a lot. <laughs> well, that is, but I'm dedicated there's going to be this new Olympic sport that gets added. Mm -hmm. And when it comes out, I'm going to be like podium ready. I'm going to be ready to, to <laughs> wear a medal from it. It's exciting. Yeah. I, it's kind of funny because we have a lot of friends that like we do have been working out for a long time. Actually, it's kind of been working out. It's been a family, family thing for us, right? Yeah. From when kids were young and, uh, so we we've got friends that are working out that have never seen a gym <laughs> which is good so there's again another opportunity that something you haven't done before that you can give a try so have you heard this rumor about this new olympic sport no i haven't oh yeah it's hot tub singing so i've been training <laughs> okay we're back to the singing yeah <laughs> and anyway, the song the song that comes to my mind, you know, when you're home all day and it's kind of a long day, a lot of days are kind of long, is I, that old song, and I don't know whoever, who did it, but there's a kind of hush all over the world. Oh, yeah, that's a very pretty song, yeah. Hush yeah. all over the world. Yeah. yeah, who did that song? Hey, Google, who did the song, There's a Kind of Hush All Over the World? There's a Kind of Hush was recorded by the Carpenters. By the uh, Carpenters, yeah. There's a kind of hush all over the world tonight. Like something like that, right? Yeah. That's exactly. You got it. Yeah. yeah. Yes. So, um, okay. Do we want, what else do we want to talk about? You talked about family solidarity. We've talked about the counseling services. Okay. So why, why young, why women and children mostly or families if there's not a family, well, a woman and child is a family, right? It's just a different fi yes. form of family. So, so the family solidarity, solidarity is whatever that family structure looks like. But why is yes. that? What led you to say, this is where I want to contribute. This is where I want to make a difference. Uh, you know, it, it kind of started um, Years and years. Well, when I had my kids, I wanted to be my, I wanted to be a mom, but and I wanted to be a healthy mom. Um, I unfortunately had a mom that that was uh, very ill, mentally ill through her whole life. Uh, she had different types of diagnosis, but um, she was under psychiatric care for most of her life. And so, when I had my children, I was actually a little concerned about it. And, and felt that I really wanted to be a healthy mom and what did I need to do in, in order to do that? And so that's where it started for me. And so this family solidarity approach, that's been my, our approach to life. It's what I've learned um, as I kept trying to reach my goal of being a healthy mom. And it meant learning about a lot of, you know, a lot of basic life skills that aren't basic anymore. Right. And, and so when I, I would, I would work with people one-on-one -on -one and, and help them and support them through the, the training, counseling training that I had. But then I also got to a point where I wanted to be able to manage. To me, it's about family management. I wanted to manage better. So when I looked for contracts, I have for, have contracted for again, 25 years, because I always like to do something outside of the home as well as what I did seeing clients. Because when you see clients, 
your learning curve is not great because you're you're on your own it's working alone working at home all the time so i always like to work with another organization like i did when i worked with you um doing benefits that was uh you know wonderful to see how benefits worked and how families could access benefits and all the new ways and the new things that are available and the support that's available but i also that's i worked for when you have some kind of solution that helps right that makes people yes. life better it makes yes. their health better right so hard to interrupt go ahead again so understanding it and then i worked with uh you know worked on the with the financial counseling side to understand more about budgeting and and how to do the financials. I worked with an insurance company for a period of time. I worked with a financial advisor. So, so all these administrative positions oh, that I- Oh, you for profits as well as a fundraising. Profits in the social service side, doing some fundraising and doing some nonprofit management as an executive director. So I worked with disabilities um, as a, a director with the Epilepsy Association. I worked with, the, with cancer. Uh, as well and I worked with the Red Cross for a couple of years so all these little contracts that I was able to pick up were just all for me they're part of life training and so helpful in giving me uh, some uh, knowledge uh, that I could help guide people you know today walking into a bank is difficult for some people banking is difficult let alone investing uh, we, we've made life so complicated everything is so process driven and so complicated that the average family can't even keep up with the changes and what they need to know and uh, and unfortunately there's what i learned through my bankruptcy experience is you know the people are um, often led down um, a dark path um, by what, what we called you know what we call advisors or people who are supposed to help us we don't always get the best advice. We have to have a certain level of basic knowledge in order to understand the advice that we're given. So it, it's just been my life. It's, yeah. yeah. Well, part of that, you know, part of the thing that does cause some problems and has caused is the, just the pace, right? How fast, uh, how fast the world moves and also mm -hmm. how much information there is, right? I was reading a book the other day and I, I, the quote was like that John Stuart Mill in 1837, Maybe it was 1873. Anyways, the last guy to know everything in the world, right? Or the last person to know everything in the world because that amount of knowledge, a human being could understand and hold that much knowledge, right? Now where every minute there's 50 hours of video being loaded on YouTube. Well, you know, nobody's, there's no human who can, who can absorb that much knowledge, right? Uh, it, you know, options. what's that? Like, too many options. Oh yeah, too many options. You have to really... So, you know, one thing that might also help now, we have a little bit of downtime, you can take a little bit more time to think and reflect on things instead of rushing to, you know, I got 87 things to do today. Let's take option B. Let's not talk about the other ones, right? So I think maybe just having a little more thought and discussion now, you can kind of slow the pace up a little bit. I tend to decide very quickly on things. My bride, Corolla, she, does, she wants to decide very, very slowly. So I'm trying to... Mm -hmm back up my pace a little and then we can kind of get more in sync with deciding right honey mm -hmm. okay but it's so true most most people don't have the time they need yeah. to review review and understand and shop around and all those things it's getting harder and harder to make good choices true uh, harder and harder hey i got a question that's a little bit off topic you know that um uh when your fundraising role and when you would book things like for Woods Homes, as an example, and it would not sell out until like the last like two days, because we live in last minute Lethbridge. Why, why is Lethbridge last minute Lethbridge? Well, uh, I don't know. I think that one of the, I just can take a guess here, but you know, my experience in the, in the fund development world and doing these galas is uh, people do so much it's actually a blessing like people do a lot and i think that you know you end up kind of looking ahead and maybe a little more short-sighted because you're you're doing stuff all the time like people in this community are so they participate so much and, right. and so i think that has a lot to do with it you know you start looking at okay what what am i doing this month not what am i doing six months ahead 
uh, just because people are very active in this community. We're so fortunate how active people are and how giving they are. Okay, I see what you're saying. So then basically they're that busy, that ram, jam packed every day kind of a thing. It's just, well, I'll go to this event if I have to decide that day because I don't know what's going to happen until that day kind of a thing. Yeah. Well, they don't decide till closer to anyway. Yeah, closer to anyways. Yeah. Closer to. For yeah. organizers of said events, it's very stressful last minute, last minute, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, it is very stressful. Yeah. Yes. I uh, was doing a mother's conference. March 21st. So this is something that, you know, I've been working on for six months because funding has been so much more difficult than ever before. I, I hit probably the most difficult funding cycle I had ever hit. Yep. Um, and then a week before uh, or two weeks before everything went sideways and it, it had to be canceled anyway. So, yeah. yeah. So it's canceled or deferred? It's canceled. Um, yeah. Because the, the funding that was allotted for that um, will now be, was put forward actually for uh, supplies and activities um, for families that are in, um, in isolation. So oh. that was, was great. The money was rerouted right away. Uh, like a lot of dollars are being rerouted now yes. that are going to be going uh, direct, any directions to support families or those uh, facing the virus. So yes. that's a good yeah, so I was just having a chat earlier today with Charlene Davidson from the Community Foundation. And yes. She knows what's going on in the community and all those kind of things. And they have a big COVID-19, like emergency funding type program, right? Where people could donate to it. And they're going to just basically shift, keep it very fluid, shift resources with what needs to happen, right? Because like from my perspective, I'm thinking, must be food banks. Food banks must need money, right? That's That's maybe the place to go. And she's saying, well... The Lethbridge Food Bank certainly needs support. The Interfaith Food Bank is sitting really good right now because all of Corvan raised 100000 went to the Interfaith Food Bank. I don't know if that was his plan or just how it worked out. But anyway, so Interfood, Interfaith's got lots, apparently, but Lethbridge Food Bank does not, and so they need help. Uh, and then I guess even the, you know, the so it's it's interesting in that, whereas normally they just have an endowment and they would only invest in the community the return, now they're investing the whole amounts that are coming in and they're just gonna direct them as whatever's needed to solve the, the current need, right, that's required, so. Which I think that's brilliant. I mean, you gotta, it's, uh, you, I don't know enough about it to know, uh, but I would like to help in some way, even if it's just donating some money, I would, I would like to contribute some way, right? Because yes, you know, yeah. there's, people who are in a lot worse situation than I am for sure. So, yeah. It'll be hard on the nonprofits though. You as well coming from the nonprofit world, you're, you know, involved in so many nonprofits. It'll be such a difficult time for them because so many of their services, any type of social service that is face to face or yeah. uh, it's difficult to well, continue. Our, yeah. Our, we had lobster fest as our fundraiser in May been a, a lot of an event we've done for, I don't know how long, long time, a decade or more. And, uh, and Lobster Fest, big fundraiser for us, right? So now can't happen in May. So it's been deferred or maybe not, but hopefully we're trying to do it later in the year, November or something like that, because there's no way it's going to happen in May. And then the other one is Rib Fest, which is supposed to be in July. Well, again, that was, we had big hopes for that being a big fundraiser and Rotary basically does those activities to raise the money to support the community things where we can where we think we can invest best to serve the community right so that's and then with that we add in some of our own man money and money we can match granting things or match get matching grants from rotary and then also our like that we have people here that will actually roll up their sleeves and come out and help kind of a thing too right so that event like how do you so we have to kind of like pivot and all right what's our new role how can we contribute now in our new environment like how is that going to look right so yeah i know some of the grocery stores like i walk to uh, a local grocery store just because i don't go often and then i just walk over but um they they have food bank boxes and packages too on every cashier now and Good. that's awesome because like you said uh, you know some people are not impacted um as much by this as if you're still working and so we, we just, I do it with every, every time I go to the grocery store. Um, it's, you know, something we can all contribute because we want to make sure that all these families that are 
home um, can access food for their kids. That's definitely, yeah, definitely. There's a, uh, <coughs> excuse me, the, you know, there's whatever we can do to contribute that way to make life easier for them will also take pressure off all our uh, medical help, our medical professionals out there and our first responders, right? People get enough to eat, they're gonna likely stay healthier, right? They're gonna likely not be, you know, uh, be irritable and angry and getting into fights or whatever either, right? You know, those kind of things, it's helpful, I think, as a preventative too, right? So. So I know, Alan, you've been for years and years highly involved with victim services. Mm -hmm. um, so um, can you tell, I'm just interested, you know, again, this is a, a just a really significant uh, service in our community. What are they doing during this? Where Are they unable to go into a home after something yeah, happens? We're, we're doing it all remotely, all telephone and Zoom and, you know, those yeah. kind of things because we excuse me we need to keep our advocates safe right we we can't have them spreading disease and we can't have them getting disease so we need to keep them safe <coughs> excuse me safe and so they have to uh they have to do it remotely but we're still doing our a lot of things duties they would normally do like court as an example well court's not happening right now right so then they can shift to more check in with their with their uh, their folks that they're trying to help and see how they're doing right they do amazing work and it's such like emotional work right I could never do it like you even though the work you do too it's way too emotional for me but I, I'm very grateful and honored that there are these people that are willing to put themselves in harm's way emotionally to help others you're one of them for sure you're like a major do-gooder type, type gal so <laughs> so what else was I gonna say oh I know I have a theory. I shared this with my bride. I've act, I shared it a couple times. And what happens when I share it, then I get people, the women that I talk to, kind of poo-poo it. They don't agree with it. But I'm going to share it with you because you're you and see what you think of it. I believe from a societal perspective that women are the better human beings. Would you agree with that? Um no, I different. I'd say different. I say different. I think, yeah, I, I don't. You know, I certainly noticed this. So I'm gonna, I'm just gonna say one of the places where things are changing would be in the next generation, like our younger generations. Um, women have had a tendency, I think, because of role. I wouldn't say they're 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 better, but they have been more humanitarian because mothering is the role has been more a humanitarian caring role uh, but it's interesting in these next generations earlier than or later than us alan that's not what i'm seeing there's a real uh there we're, we have the younger generations are uh very much uh humanitarians okay okay it's, it's awesome to watch yeah i have a i have lots of I've been doing this for so long that I get a lot of young adults um, who's, who I worked with, you know, their mom, <laughs> and then I get to see them and wow, it's uh, just amazing. Yeah. yeah. So I, and I think it is, I, uh, your point, I think is, is true, but I think it's because of the roles that women were placed in, not because necessarily a personality or it's just, the roles and responsibilities we've been given. So let me ask you this question on that same theme then. If I had came to the conclusion that men were the better human beings and I told a man that, what do you think he'd say? He'd say, of course. I think he'd say yes. Yeah. yeah. But, but here's, what my, here's what my rationale. It's a three-part argument. You okay. think of birth, birth, life, and death, right? So birth... Who contributes more to the birthing process, the men or the women? Yeah, yeah we know that answer. <laughs> men, men could be replaced with a turkey baster, right? Period. That's all their job is. Women grow a baby inside them, comfort the baby, keep the baby together. Have I, I, I'm told it's fairly uncomfortable process when the baby comes out their vagina, as bad as a man cold or something like that, I would assume. Anyways, and then with that baby, then feeds the baby with their own body. 
in the last couple months of her pregnancy, her brain will shrink in size and rewire to be mummy brain. That's like, to me, this is amazing, the contribution that women do in that part of life. Men, not so much. Through life, all of the things that are important to keep people healthy and alive, uh, you know, healthcare type services, social services, childcare, women doing it all, right? And then in addition to doing all those things, they cook most of the meals, they keep the house up, they buy groceries, they pay the bills, they do all those things in life. And then in death, one, there's the people that are part of palliative care, of end of life care, that kind of thing. I believe them to be predominantly women. Further, the cause of deaths, not just natural, living a long time and dying, but the causes of violent death, who causes more violent death, men or women? Men, for sure. So there's my three-part argument where I believe from a societal perspective, women are the better human beings. Hmm. <laughs> I haven't got one woman who says, oh, that makes perfect sense to me. But anyways, I'm going to keep trying because there's somebody out there that believes that. I think it makes sense. But <laughs> Well, we... we possibly believe it but we maybe don't have the same level of ego <laughs> that males do okay well that's more in our being humble we uh yeah okay so you say it's true but you never admit it because you're humble i'm humble yeah <laughs> is that what you say too corolla i i could see that because women tend to think you know if a man's offered a job that that he's not qualified for, he'll do it. Whereas a woman will always think she needs more. Oh, right? you might not have heard. Did you hear her comment? Yeah, I did hear. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Yeah. So if, for, if you didn't hear the comment, Corolla's comment if was. If a woman's qualified, she'll think she needs another. Right. You know, some more. If, some if there's training. a job offered, a man will say, yep, yeah, I can do that. And a woman will say, oh, I'm not so sure. I might have to take this other course. Or I might have to prepare more. Right. That's your point. Right. Yeah. Yes, exactly. But that's I would, I'd like to believe that right now and part of the family solidarity movement as well is that we need each other. Yes. And, you know, I have the trustee that I worked with. I had coffee with him a couple of weeks ago and he's, you know, this is the reality. This is the, you know, statistically in eight to nine months, uh, women are going to be having babies and couples are going to be getting divorced. And that's, uh, you know, the, one of the number one reasons for bankruptcy is divorce. Oh. And so um, I think that right now we really need each other. And that, so it just brings us to the point of that shared responsibility and talking to each other and working through things and supporting each other emotionally right now is huge, especially right. if you have a partner that is more sensitive. It's, it's not about weaker. It's about sensitivity. A lot of people are extremely sensitive to what's going on your wife would be one of those <laughs> yeah she's such a, a soft like, you know she's a soft wonderful woman and doesn't have to be a woman a, some some of us are just not as good at, at you know st standing up to some of the things going on in the world right now it's difficult energy it's it's very very difficult and it's very sad if you're sensitive it's a very dark and, and gloomy time so uh, we really do need each other and it's an, um, important to focus on each other and take care of each other so at the end of this that you still have uh sustained your family unit yeah yeah no it makes real good sense and i agree and it's not you'd said it's not just women and it's not right there's there's yeah. men who are more sensitive or this hits them harder than women does right than, mm -hmm. some, than some women do i'm kind of more in my case Kroll is very concerned about it i'm saying hey, we are healthy, we have great immunity, right? Like our great immune system, a robust immune system. We're healthy, uh, we eat well, we take good precautions when we go out in public places. So, you know, our chances are very, very small of contracting coronavirus. And if we did, it would be fairly minor in impact is what I believe, right? So now Kroll is saying, you don't know that. And that may be true, but I'm going to believe that because I think it makes sense. And I'm pretty sure that's how it's going to uh, play out, right? That, yes, we're going to re reinvent ourselves a bit. I'm going to take, I got two more books to finish reading, and then I'm going to start taking some courses online. Um, so I'm like, I'm going to use this opportunity 
to kind of learn as much as I can. So I'm, I'm, I'm excited about it. I'm like, I'm looking after clients to that. I can safely help them. Uh, but after those obligations are met, I'm going to take the rest of my time and shift it into more uh, personal development type stuff. So, yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, and the other place that people can help is if you have uh, family members or friends or people, you know, that are healthcare workers. Yeah. Um, we have, um, you know, my husband who's doing senior care right now, it, it's terrifying. It, it, they, the seniors are frightened. Their families are frightened. Staff is yeah. frightened. Uh, I have. Um, and probably yeah. the families have stopped visiting for fear they're going to get their seniors. Oh, everything is in, in lockdown, so they can't visit. Right. Um, anyone working in emergency right now is, uh, we have a family, I have a family member working in emergency. I have one working just in general in the hospital, like nurses and staff. And it's a very difficult time for them. It's frightening. Um, it's a scary time. And, and so if, you know, if, if it simply means, you know, sending them a, a text <laughs> that says, you know, I, I'm just, I know what, like just some kind of acknowledgement and appreciation for what they're doing, uh, because it would be hard. It doesn't matter what level you're at within the healthcare system, it would be hard not to go to work in fear. Definitely. Yeah. And that's no. very and I, like I clearly understand the, the seniors in the, in the lodging. Cause if it, if it gets, um, you know, spreads in that environment, there's going to be the, it's going to be very, very damaging. Right. And mm-hmm. certainly, certainly in a, in a health care setting as well, where you're putting your health at risk to help others. Right. So, I mean, best thing you and I could do stay healthy. So we're not a burden on that system right now. Right. So, I mean, we'll get it figured out, but we got to get it where we can, it's a manageable degree of people infected in order to the healthcare system not be overwhelmed with it. Right. So. Mm-hmm. Yeah. let them know how much you appreciate them great idea um, a hard great day's idea. work is something that you know they've never known what such a hard day's work we we can't even imagine how hard it must be for those that are working front lines so we need to be very appreciative and let them know that we care and and pray for them yeah <laughs> just yeah. maybe we can yeah no it makes sense no it makes sense cool um so what else do we want to? What time is it, anyways? Six twenty-seven. Yep. So we need to know. Three. We need to know what the, one of the thousand ways is. I'm sorry. Say again. I said you started when we started today. You said that I would be able to add to the one of the thousand ways. Yes, I did say that, and I think you did, and I think uh, many times, but one for sure is just about being appreciative, especially for those people who are putting themselves in harm way to keep us healthy, right? So I think that is definitely, appreciation is probably a hundred of the thousand ways is appreciation for different aspects of your life, I believe, so. Now, Connie Marie, you don't know this, but I always end this show with a song. Oh, that's yeah. kind of like work days used to be, Alan. It was good. <laughs> okay, so now. What kind of song, do you have any kind of preference for music you could take that, like to listen to? Maybe I can find something that'll, that'll work for you. Ah, oh, what kind of music do I like to listen to? Yes. Don't tell me rap. I'm going to stop talking to you if you tell me rap. No. Okay, good. You have your own genre or you do all genres? Well, I like, I, I'm a big fan of Mavis Staples. Mavis Staples is this R&B singer. And yes. she's amazing. Every word she sings, I believe that it is true. And she's got such an expressive voice. I'm a big fan of Mavis Staples. I told oh, that, you, I'm, I'm in love with Mavis Staples, but it's just her voice. Let me challenge you then and ask you to pick something that would be your contribution to the A Thousand Ways. Okay. All right. Okay. That's a good one, Connie Marie. Okay. Mm-hmm. So let me just think about this. <clears throat> Should I do, did you listen to that other one, Corolla? I, I didn't listen to the whole thing. Okay, you know what? No, no, I'm not going to do that one. I did one earlier this week with a little kind of a suggestion and then a song, mm-hmm. and that was a Mavis Staples song, but I'm going to sing a different Mavis Staples song that I think more reflects our reality that we're all in this together, okay? That's kind of that. I've changed her song a little bit. Mavis, if you're listening, I'm apologizing for changing your song. But basically, okay, so here it goes. 
We shall be, we shall not be moved. We shall not, we shall not be moved like a tree that's planted by the water. We shall not be moved. I'm fighting for our children. We shall not be moved. I'm fighting for our children. We shall not be moved just like a tree that's standing by the water. We shall not be moved. A standing for our sisters. We shall not be moved. A standing for our sisters. We shall not be moved. Just like a tree that's planted by the water. We shall not be moved. Working with our brothers. We shall not be moved. Working with our brothers, we shall not be moved just like a tree that's planted by the water. We shall not be moved. Log song, I take a drink. Black and white together, we shall not be moved. Black and white together, we shall not be moved just like a tree that's planted by the water. We shall not be moved. Black and yellow together, we shall not be moved. Black and yellow together, we shall not be moved. Just like a tree that's planted by the water. We shall not be moved. White and yellow together, we shall not be moved. A white and yellow together. We shall not be moved. Just like a tree that's planted by the water. We shall not be moved. We shall not be moved. We shall not be moved. Awesome. Scroll and clap as well. Day. Two people in the audience clapping. Hallelujah. <laughs> well, Connie Marie, I really appreciate I didn't even say your last name. You know why? Riedel Huber, is that how you pronounce it? That's, you did it. That's dead on, it. yes. Connie Marie Riedel Huber. Her website is, what is it, Life Design Network? Life, LifeDesign.net? www.lifedesignnetwork.ca. Okay, LifeDesignNetwork.ca. So she is a lovely, caring, compassionate person who likes to work with women and families to make their life better and make adjustments as they go to make tomorrow better than today. Is that a fair statement? Yes, and thank you, Alan, for all the lives you make better. I, you know, working with you that, those couple of years and watching you, like this guy runs all the time for community. Like you are so, so um, committed and so giving and so thank you for how you serve because it's continuous and never ending makes my heart feel glad Connie Marie thank you so much for saying that thank you well have yourself a great evening and then maybe we'll have you back on here again another time awesome good night okay good night Connie Marie anything to say Corolla good night good night Corolla says good night good night Corolla